Good morning, and welcome. I'm your host, Jason Mink. Young love, I didn't understand it. Hell, I barely experienced it. You know, when it came to game, I lived about as far from the Milton Bradley factory as you could possibly get. But teenage passion is hard to quench, and it can manifest in some unusual ways. Join me now as I walk you through three uncomfortable four-color crushes I probably ought to not talk about on this episode of Comics for Breakfast. We begin with my first comics crush, Tula, a.k.a. Aqua Girl. Now, I met Tula through a stack of 60s-era DCs that my aunt had left over from her oldest son. I was born in 1970, so by the time I read those comics, the books already had a patina and vintage to them that set them apart from other books that I might find on the spinner rack. In contrast to Marvel's disco-era funk and grittiness, those DC books featured clean, almost sterile artwork, and none more so than the handful of Aquaman in the pile. Even as a kid, I felt Aquaman was kind of lame. I know, I know, he's great, and you've got lots of reasons why. Look, this isn't about you and Aquaman! It was actually the Nick Cardi artwork that hooked me. There was just something about the way he drew that underwater world. The buildings, the vehicles, the women... Okay, sure, I was young, but they still caught my eye. And yes, Mira was lovely, but to a preteen, well, that was a lot of woman. Better to start a little closer to my own age, and the folks at DC delivered in the form of Tula. Spunky, impulsive, and cute as a button, Tula was everything young mink might find appealing. And add belonging to her fantastic world and the Appeal only grew. Now, I was lucky enough to have this book in an early age. This isn't my original copy, but uh, it'll do. Let's get right to it. After helping Aquaman with a rescue operation at sea, where else? Aqualad is in a bit of a funk. Atlantis is nowheresville ever since Aquaman got married and had a baby. Omira had the baby, but you know what I'm saying. It seems kicks just keep getting harder to find, but this time, the kicks have found Aqualad in the form of Tula. No longer the pigtailed tag-along he knew as a kid, Tula has bloomed into young adulthood, and Aqualad dug what he saw. And so did young Mink. It's those big crazy eyes. I know now, they mean bad news, and you should head for the hills, but hey, I've always been a sucker for them. The kids decide to split the scene and go to tell the king and queen. Only it don't go so well, with the adults questioning the wisdom of cutting out without a helpful wail or something as a chaperone. Mira is a real pill here. I mean, she is hard to take in this issue, even with all that water to swallow after. In spite of Arthur allegedly being the king of the sea, it's Big Red here who seems to be calling the shots, and she don't cotton to the kids in their untrammeled optimism. In spite of all the static, Tula convinces Aqualad to leave Atlantis with her. She is certain there's fun to be had in the Seven Seas, and is quickly proven right when they come across an underwater discotheque. Top that, Marvel! The teeners tear it up, attracting the notice of the club's owner, Dr. Dorsal, who is remarkably forward in his thinking when it comes to entertainment complexes, but typically old school when it comes to doing crimes. He decides the TNA here are the perfect patsies and hypnotizes them with his pet eel. Ah, for fun. 
The charge of DC Comics writers being old and out of touch has been made countless times, and, well, this is a great example. <laughs> From the wince-inducing dialogue to the Sherwood Schwartz-esque characterization, this comic is about as hollow as Dollar Store Easter candy. I'm not saying it's bad. The story is silly fun and doesn't take itself too seriously, which is a smart move when you're dealing with aquatic teenagers and underwater dance clubs. It just feels a bit... Is pandery a word? It should be. Considering how quickly these two turned to evil, maybe Mira was right, after all. I mean, there isn't a trace of resistance here. Laddie and Chicky go along with everything with huge vacant smiles on their faces. They really seem to be having the fun they were looking for. Consequences be damned. The whole hypnotism thing just seems like a convenient excuse to be fishy JDs. I mean, what about all those other kids? They didn't get hypnotized by no eel. The gang hides out on an isolated section of beach from the Coast Guard. Before the obligatory clam bake can break out, they encounter an elderly shell picker who tells them the Coast Guard knows where they are and is on the way. The kids and their new pal head back to Dr. Dorsal's place, but things are far from Sea Moon. Dorsal, who is Jimmy Carl Black levels of ugly, suspects the shell picker is a spy, but he's got bigger fish to fry, so to speak. Dorsal sends the gang off to a shipyard to steal a submarine, which is a nice step up from swiping swim trophies and dowager's jewelry. The shell picker tags along, and surprise, he's revealed to be Aquaman in disguise. This snaps the kids out of their fugue state, and they go after Dr. Dorsal, who manages to slip away and escape to his home dimension. Okay. Sure, why not? This is Aquaman we're talking about here, after all. In the end, the kids learn their lesson, everyone has a good laugh, and all is well with the world. At least, until those teen hormones rear their heads again. I'll tell you a story. I was maybe nine years old, and my parents had purchased a swimming pool. We had a big yard and it seemed like the thing to do. Getting the pool built and filled was an adventure unto itself, but in short order it was up and running. We enjoyed it for a summer or so, and then we moved, but midway through, I had a dream. In it, I met a girl, and I fell in love with her. For some undisclosed reason, one of my uncles took it upon himself to cut gills in my young love, and she was sentenced to live the rest of her life in my swimming pool. I know, it's absurd to say it out loud now, of course, but at the time it had a profound effect on me. I remembered the ache, the yearning to be with this person, separated from me by the distance of an entire world, and I'm guessing this stupid comic had something to do with it. <laughs> Thanks for the scars, DC. I overcame this seemingly insurmountable point fairly quickly. After all, teenagers are nothing if not resilient. Pretty soon, Tula was a distant memory, and I moved on to the world of more modern comics. On the weekends, my father worked in a warehouse that stripped and repackaged paperback books, magazines, and, most importantly comics. Every so often he'd bring me home a big stack of these, pulled at random from the canvas bins, and uh, I got to experience comics that I wouldn't have otherwise had in my collection. Ended up with a number of uh, small press titles, uh, one-shots, reprints, a wide variety of books, including this one. Now, granted, she'd made her debut years previous in Marvel's Conan, but all young Mink knew was that uh, his copy of Red Sonja number six was special. Oh, sure, chuckle away. You laugh, but chances are, if you were that age, you were right there with me. We'd never seen anything quite like it, or if we had, well, then we'd probably move past comic books. 
The fact is, Red Sonia was a jolt of pure adrenaline to our preteen synapses, driving our hormones into overdrive. So what's the comic about? The story concludes events of the previous issue. Red Sonia has ascended to the mysterious singing tower where her companion, Mikhail, is being held. As she draws closer, Sonia realizes the singing is actually an incessant buzzing. In spite of her best efforts, she is unable to find her way into the odd structure, and before she realizes what is happening, she is knocked unconscious by the intoxicating scent of the exotic flowers around her. A mute pair appear on the scene, spiriting the drug Sonia into the still thrumming tower. The weirdly silent beings begin to prepare and trust Sonia for some nameless ritual deep within the catacombs, but the she-devil manages to regain consciousness and fights back. The creatures immediately enclose themselves in a protective cocoon, leaving the puzzled Sonia to make her own way forward. She follows the infernal humming to a vast chamber where an enormous woman has been cocooned in the honeycombed walls. Sonia manages to communicate with the imprisoned woman and deigns to set her free, but there's more to the situation than she realizes. The tendrils that bind the giant grow back quicker than our heroine can cut them. Worse still, the same tendrils fight to subsume Red into the hellish trap alongside the giant she seeks to free. An army of acorn-helmeted fairies appear and sting Red into submission, then feed her an incapacitating nectar. We discover this to be the work of the hideous beekeeper who has used Mikhail as bait. It seems the Keeper captures regular women and then grows them to enormous size to act as queens for his hive. And if that wasn't someone's unrealizable fetish before they'd seen this video review, well, I bet my bottom dollar it is now. Mikhail gets thumped, Red is given more nectar, but surprise! She prefers savory to sweet and spits out the offending ichor before it can have its intended effect. She frees herself and prepares to go after the keeper, but the old queen begs for death. It is the only way. Sonia begs the gods for forgiveness and kills the poor wretch, which causes all of the acorn-headed fairies to die. Enraged by this turn of events, the Keeper goes after Red, but she's built up one heck of a head of steam and isn't about to stop until justice has been done. Her blade rested away by the Keeper, Sonia uses the next nearest thing as a weapon and clobbers her foe with a cocoon full of ravenous grubs. It's poetic justice as the Keeper is consumed by his own charges and Red and Mikhail are free again. There's some talk of the connection between their two mystical rings, but Sonia pays it little mind, this adventure already fading in the red-hot glow of what's to come. Written by Roy Thomas and Wendy Pinney, and uh, from a plot by Claire Noto, The Singing Tower is one bizarre read, uh, even from a 1970s sword and sorcery standpoint. I remember being suitably freaked out by the roach-like sentries and, of course, the near-to-bursting hive queen. These concepts are brought to life by the one and only Frank Thorne, who was the Red Sonia artist back in the day. And while much of the emphasis is on Thorne's bombastic beauties, uh, you can focus equally on the remarkable worlds that he creates for these beings to uh, appear in. Honestly, the art here is even better than I remember. I'll certainly be going back. Who knows what else I missed. My final comic crush came in what we'll call the dark years. Our boy was 16 and looking for something new. Comics still held appeal, but the old favorites had lost a bit of their allure. Surely there was something out there to appeal to my now purient interests, and the local Comic-Con came through. Among the shiny bag copies of JLA, TMNT, and PPT, SSM, were dollar bins of plenty. 
In the days before the internet and movie speculation driving up the prices of anything remotely interesting, a patient shopper might still find bargains in those dollar bins. Thumbing through a box, I came across a stack of Vampirella, and my teenage world was forever changed. From those early days peeping at my grandpa's workbench postcard of Betty Page about to be bitten on the ass by an alligator, to the silky sensuality of the Hammer film femme fatales, I've always gravitated towards brunettes, so vampy was seemingly tailor-made for readers like me. In a nutshell, Vampirella is forced to flee from her native planet of Draculon, which can no longer sustain life. Arriving on Earth, she meets a scientist who creates a synthetic substitute for the blood that she needs to live. Now on her own, Vampy attempts to make her way in our modern world, but is routed by the forces of great evil, as well as the relentless Van Helsing clan. Got all that? Let's go. Our story fittingly begins at night in a lonely graveyard. Only it's not so lonely as Vampirella has taken shelter here after the events of the previous issue. Unfortunately, she is not alone as two locals have also shown up with the intent of robbing the tomb of the town's richest family. They get more than they bargain for when they wrest the tomb door open. Something lurks within, an ancient and corrupt being that quickly dispatches the two men. Drawn to the commotion, Vampy catches sight of the strange entity, but before she can react, it exerts its powerful will on her, causing the nubile nymph to swoon. Cut to the mansion of W. W. Wade, the owner of the recently violated tomb. Rich but elderly, Wade seeks reinvigoration as his wretched life is nearing its end. Around him he has gathered an assemblage of quack charlatans and snake oil salesmen in a bid to prolong his existence, but it's clear that they have no real power. After setting the scene and establishing his corruption in the form of his pawn, Sheriff Floyd, Wade scampers out to the graveyard. It seems he'd noticed the activity earlier, and he heads down to the tomb to see what's cooking. There, Wade encounters Scar, an ancient being in the old man's thrall. Scar has served Wade throughout his lifetime, but once he dies, the demon will be able to claim his soul. Only Wade doesn't plan on dying any time soon. He confronts Scar about the girl that he noticed in the graveyard tussle earlier, and it's revealed she has been taken captive. There's something different about this one, and Wade has his suspicions why. We cut to the outskirts of town, where the Van Helsings are searching for the girl. And lucky day, they encounter Sheriff Floyd, who just happens to be out looking for them. How's that for a coincidence? Back at Wade's, Vampy has been imprisoned in the basement. The formula she needs to consume every 24 hours has been destroyed by Wade, who, after meeting her face to face, has grown more confident in his assumptions of her unnatural qualities. Still, it never hurts to consult an expert, so Wade and the captured Van Helsings all head down to the basement to play that musical question... Is it really a vampire? The elder Van Helsing flips when he sees Vampy, convinced that she is his brother's killer. Alas, he proves ineffectual, as does his grandson Adam. Cane gun! Now that his suspicions are confirmed, Wade lays it out on the table. He wants his prisoner to turn him into a vampire so that he can cheat death. As plans go... It's not bad. Not bad at all. However, Vampy finds the idea rightfully unappealing and resists. That's fine. Wade can be patient, and sooner or later, his guest must feed. Beneath his contempt, Wade leaves the Van Helsings in the basement with Vampy. Soon enough, she succumbs to her insatiable hunger and breaks free of her shackles, but at the last moment can't bring herself to feed on young Adam. Drawn by all the racket, Wade and Sheriff Floyd head down to the basement. 
Floyd gets a stake through his heart for his trouble, and the Van Helsings beat a hasty retreat. Wade demands again Vampy bite and transform him. Now deliriously weak, the Princess of Draculon finally gives in, snuffing Wade quickly. However, he does not rise. Scar appears to explain Vampy's alien physiology is too different from Wade's, and that the bite and loss of blood have killed the old man permanently. Upon no longer, Vampy and the Van Helsings leave the scene, while Scar ferries his immortal prize off to dimensions unknown. To say I was taken by this character would be a bit of an understatement. I did my best to piece together a run, but as a young man, money was pretty tight and conventions only happened a few times a year. I simply wasn't able to keep up with Vampy's adventures, and by the time the character was reintroduced in the 1990s as part of the bad girl craze, I was pretty past it. That whole decade kind of left me cold. That said, it's great to be able to look back on these wonderful old magazines. The artwork here is stunning. Jose Gonzalez delivers the goods, providing a murky and immersive atmosphere for his characters to cavort. His representation of the demon Scar is especially notable, a truly arresting image in a magazine full of them. It's pretty, 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 pretty good. I'm Jason Mink. Thank you for joining me this morning. If you enjoyed this episode, please like, share, and subscribe. If it really knocked you out, head over to the Old Guys Who Like Old Comics swag shop and pick up a mug, a t-shirt, or a mask. Any cash that we make goes right back into making the quality kind of productions that you can only find here on the Old Guys Who Like Old Comics Network. I'm your host, Jason Mink, and I hope to see you next week at breakfast.